You are listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim, a podcast dedicated to helping those in the private lending industry grow, improve, and streamline their business. I'm Kevin Kim, partner at Jirasi LLP, the nation's largest private lending law firm. Join me as we chat with the best and brightest in private lending, who are eager to share their years of wisdom and best practices with lenders, borrowers, brokers, investors, and more. Subscribe to Lender Lounge on your favorite podcast platform and learn more about Jirasi and how we can work with you at JirasiLawFirm.com. Check out the episode summary for other valuable resources. Hey guys, Kevin Kim here with another episode of Lender Lounge. We are in season five. Today we are in the computer. I am interviewing someone I've been wanting to talk to for years, and we finally have connected. Mike, please introduce yourself to our audience and let's get started. Sure. Uh, My name is Mike Hoffman. I am the CEO and founder of Longhorn Investments. I'm a lawyer. (laughs) Don't practice much law anymore. Um, And I've been in the lending space. I I started doing loans in 2008. I've been wanting to talk to someone from Longhorn for a very long time. And, you know, we've been in the business since 08, X07. And we've always, we always knew about Longhorn here at Jurassic. Oh, yeah, those guys, those guys. For some strange reason over the year, I don't know what, how or why, you know, we made inroads into Texas probably around 2012, and we would like to think that we've got a good feel on the Texas market, but we never got, we never were able to connect with you guys. I'm so glad that we're able to talk today, and hopefully we can talk after this. But, you know, one of the things I like for you to tell the world about is our audience and is is kind of, you know, tell us about Longhorn, tell us about the story. You guys are, you guys are one of the more, I would consider you guys kind of like le- legacy you know, private lenders have been around. You started during the recession, and you guys are kind of a traditional private lender, right? You're not institutional. You're not, co- you know, conventional. You you've kind of followed that formula, and you're also in the great state of Texas. So, give us a little bit, bit of background about the company and yourself, and we'll and then we'll go into some questions. Sure, sure. So, I I feel like I have a very non conventional way into this business, right? Um, I, I tell everybody when they ask, how'd you get into hard money lending? I was like, I stumbled into this business, right? Uh, very simply, I was at, uh, I was working in a law firm. I did not do real estate. My background is personal injury litigation, uh, both plaintiff and defense work. And I left the firm I was at and we, um, I, I left with a, a, a partner of mine and she had a boyfriend who was in the, uh, was a mortgage broker. And so she said, hey, while we are uh, starting our law firm up, uh, we should start doing some title closings to make some additional funds, you know, why, why we get things going. And I was like, that sounds great, except neither one of us knew anything about title. Um, and so I uh, contacted a friend of mine who, in Texas, you don't have to be a direct operation. You can be a lawyer and can be a fee office of a title company. So I talked to a friend of mine who was a fee office. He introduced us to a, a, a title company that uh, said, you can be a fee office, you have to hire an escrow officer. So we ended up hiring an escrow officer. And um, through title closings, I met folks that uh, wholesale homes. And this is in 2008. And uh, I did not know what wholesaling of homes was. I had never heard of it, didn't understand it, didn't know what was Auctions going on. were on fire in 08 in Texas. They were just so busy. <laughs> so it, it was... It was So the auction business had started, but like for me, I I wasn't part of that world, right? So I I didn't know what was happening. Right. And so uh, I ended up, uh, I'll give a shout out here to Mark Bloom of uh, Net Worth Realty. And Mark and I became friends and he introduced me uh, to the wholesale business. And one day we went to lunch and he said, you ought to be a hard money lender. And I said, what's a hard money lender? And so he said, he explained the A to B, B to C transaction and said, C has got to use cash or hard money. And so I said, great, you know, I'll give it a try. And so uh, literally my mom and I funded the first loan, a buddy and I funded the second loan, now I'm out of money. And so, you know, I I did my two deals and uh, I had another guy who was sharing office space with me at the time, who I explained to him what I was doing. Uh, And he basically said, Mike, you know, you're crazy. You don't know what you're doing. Uh, at least let me do the loan docs to protect you. And I said, great. And so uh, he did the loan docs for me. And after we did a couple deals, he was like, you know, maybe this could be a real business. And so we had met each other at the University of Texas. And so that's where we were friends. So we started Longhorn and the one and two were taken. So Longhorn Three Investments, LLC. And oh, so that's, that's why you're three? That, 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 that's the only reason? 
<laughs> yep. <I'm> not- <laughs> nope. There's no, there was nothing special. It was just, you know, it's all we could get. And the name uh, stuck. Adam changed it. And that's awesome. We got a DBA four years later of Longhorn Investments. So right. technically we can use Longhorn Investments, but, you know, technically we are Longhorn Three Investments. So that happens. We start doing loans. And look, I, I am the traditional guy. I'm dialing for dollars, right? I am calling friends, families, relatives saying, hey, I've got these hard money loans. Uh, they're paying 14%. I'm getting uh, the points. I'll pay the point. I'll get the points and fees. I will manage the loan for you. I can foreclose for you if we need to. And that's how we got started. And, you know, it's, you know, you're putting an individual's name on a note and deed of trust. So you're doing like that call or like multi Benny early on. Okay. Yep. That's how we got started. And look, I did that for a couple of years, but it's a hard way to run a business, right? It's a hard way to know if you're going to have enough money to fund the next deal. I right? Just, yeah. I mean, that's been I my did. soapbox for 15 years is like, guys, fractional doesn't work at scale. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. And so I, um, you know, we talked about starting a fund, but I, you know, we hadn't done it before. One sure it was going to work. One sure we're going to get our investors to move over because we had a stable pool of investors that wanted deals. Right. And then um, we had to convince them also that they were getting the 14 percent interest. And I was like, at some point, it's like, look, this is a lot of work and effort to make some points and fees. You know, we've got to make some more money on this. We've got to get part of the spread. And so I I basically tried to convince my investors that I only have your money in play while the loan is in play, right? And you're tied to that one loan or that two loans that you're on. And if those loans go bad, then your money's, you know, if I got to foreclose, take the property back, your money's not working. So if we go to the fund model, uh, you'll be protected because you will be, you'll have a lot more loans that you'll be part of and your money is going to be in play consistently versus you one loan pays off. I send you the money back. I call you and let you know when we have the next loan. I mean, you know, that's a challenging way to grow your business. So, and you'll, you'll giggle at this, right? So, uh, for us to really get confidence to start a fund, we got, I, I found out about Pitbull conference, oh, right? Yeah. So we go to the Pitbull conference, uh, we meet Leonard Rosen, and we are in there listening to Pitbull. And, you know, my partner and I at the time, we're looking at each other and going, this is the right thing for us to do. Like, we need to start a fund. This gave us the confidence that, yes, we need to go do this. So we end up starting a fund, and we did a little tester fund. Uh, we raised $3.6 million that a fund was supposed to last for three years. After six months, we saw that it would work. We started our second fund which is called Trident Realty Investments, which is my current fund. And that's what we pushed our investors to get into, raise more capital into. And that is the, Longhorn is the marketing arm, the originator, the servicer of our loans. But Trident is the actual lender on the the note and deed of trust. Right, right. And this is, so all this is happening roughly around, around 11? Yep. So 2008, you know, we start doing the individual loans. 2010, we start our first fund, which was called 3565. And 2011, we started Trident. So end of 2011, we we started really going with Trident. 2012, we started funding a lot of transactions. So Trident's been around for a dozen years now. So Trident is a legacy fund in the space, 10 years old or more. Very few of those left. Yep. Um, And... The model ha- must, I mean, I mean, I like to ask you as a fund manager uh, and as a kind of more of an old school hard money lender, the market has shifted so much in the past, even just five years, but now let's, let's talk about the past 15 years. The market has changed, especially in the great state of Texas, where it's, it, it just suddenly became the most popular state to lend in. Um, yeah. And we saw you know, kind of glimmers of that in 11, but we really saw it in 14, 15, 16 was when that's really started to become a popular market. How did you guys react as Texas started to become kind of the darling of private lending in those early years? It was good and bad, right? Like that, that, that happened. Lots of deals to be had in Texas. Sure. But I, I always had a philosophy though, uh, early on, Kevin, I did not want to be all my eggs in one basket. 
right. right? I didn't want all my loans. You know, I'm in Dallas. So I didn't want all my loans in Dallas. So we started doing Dallas. Then we started Houston. Then we started San Antonio and we started spreading out. And then as Texas becomes more popular and everyone wants to do loans here, I kind of looked at it like, look, I want to do more loans in Texas, but I want to branch out. Right. And so Missouri was our next state. Missouri right? of all states. Yeah. We went to Missouri. Two reasons. My At the time, my partner was licensed to practice law in Missouri. Okay. And a uh, judicial foreclosure state. So we wanted to go places. Originally, we thought that we could do judicial foreclosure, right? Of course, that dovetailed in my next state, which was Indiana, which is a, not a judicial foreclosure state. But we were getting calls from a broker constantly saying, your product will work here. I can sell your product. Sure. Uh, will you come to Indiana? And so, look, we started growing over time and going to other states. The majority of our loans were still in Texas, but I wanted to be, I wanted to branch out a little bit and not be tied here because it was also becoming super competitive, right? When I first started, 14% four points and all borrowers said was thank you, right? They were happy there was a lender there. 2011, 2012, if you were 14 and four, they were like, hey, I can get it at 11. I can get it at 12. I can get it at 10. Uh, what are you going to do for me? And so we had to lower prices, right? We had to lower our prices. And I, I, I wanted to start l reaching out and going to other states. And so that's what we did. That's a very unique, you're, you're probably the only lender that I've ever met that, that went to the Midwest in like, that early on. The Midwest yep. has always been an underserved, hyper local market. And I mean, it's not like you had, because of the, the, the licensing of your partner that allowed you to get in this, into the market. You must have been the first, like very, very at that at that point in the market. You might have must have been the first out of town lender in town. In town, yeah, it was funny actually. We were worried about that, and so we actually registered the name like Arch Lending because uh, we thought we go to St. Louis. Right, we didn't want to be known as Longhorn Investments, bunch of Texas boys right. trying to come to Missouri and all that. But we quickly found out that um, I, I go to P.T. Barnum, right? Uh, all publicity is good publicity. Yeah, yeah. In that they remembered who we were, right? right? So even though Longhorn didn't fit into Missouri, and we look, we got pushback some local lenders. Uh, what are you doing in our space? People here, you're not local. But look, one of the things we did also is when we went to a new state, we wanted to hire someone boots on the ground that represented us. Yeah. So it wasn't just purely us being from you know Texas or some remote location running the loans, we would hire local people on the ground to be our salespeople and to be our boots on the ground. And that was, were they, did they have an office or they kind of like just working out of their houses at the time? So this is, this is the middle of, you know, 2010. So work from home didn't really exist back then, you know? No, no. So, but, but, you know, they were our, our salespeople, right? Uh -huh. So they were used to working from home. And look, frankly, a lot of people had day jobs. Right. Ah, Longhorn okay. wasn't their original because most of our borrowers came from folks that were in real estate investment clubs right. and the real estate investment clubs met at night. So that's where our people had to go. And we, we call it preaching the gospel of hard money. Right. Teach them why hard money is good, you know, for their transaction, if it works. And we try to educate people. And, th and that was the whole goal is we wanted to educate people on why and how to use hard money. And if it worked for them, great. And if it didn't work for them, we didn't try to sell it. You know, we understood. And so our salespeople oftentimes were real estate investors themselves. They fixed and flipped. And so they were part of the ecosystem already. And so then they were easier for them to go out and preach what we do. I mean, this is probably the first case I've ever heard of anyone going to the Midwest first. Indiana leads to Ohio, obviously. You guys are in Ohio, right? No, no, no. So Ohio came later. Well, later? Uh, much later. Yeah. It's a so much bigger Indiana, market. I would assume that you guys would go to Ohio right away. No, 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 no. We 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 didn't go there because look, we were we kind of dip our toes into markets, right? We don't just run and jump in, you know, off the diving board. We kind of dip our toe in, figure it out a little bit. Um, I think our next state we went to was Tennessee. So Tennessee was next, right? That early on, interesting. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, judicial foreclosure state. Yeah. And um, weird laws, very strange usury laws. <laughs> correct, correct, correct. Uh, we had lots of discussions about those. Yeah. Uh, but we went in there and uh, Tennessee was next. North Carolina was next. Okay. So you started branching the, into the Southeast. Okay. SEC, okay. ACC country, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that's where we started going next. And then um, 
I think then Alabama, then Georgia, then back to Ohio. Oh, okay. Then Arkansas, then New Mexico, right? Was it mostly a, a more of an opportunity thing where deals are coming from, driving all yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which makes sense. Those three, those Southeastern markets were growing very fast right around the mid-teens, so... Right. That and so sense. we were getting calls, you know, was, look, we were getting calls from places. We didn't do those loans. We had borrowers go out there. And, you know, so that's why we started doing deals in those places, checked out the judicial foreclosure laws. But look, there was a lot of data that we wanted to know that wasn't readily available, right? No. For CASA didn't exist, no. right? <laughs> SFR analytics didn't exist. And, you know, I wanted to know, I wanted to understand how many of our types of loans were being done in the market. I just wanted to know in Texas. Right. And Texas A&M had a college of real estate that was uh, fairly well known in the state of Texas. So we called them and said, would you do a study and tell us how many hard money loans are being done? Our types of loans are being done in Texas. And they said, sure, you know, pay us $200,000. We'll commission a study and we'll get that done. And so it's like, all right, I don't want to know that bad. I, I, uh, I don't want to know that bad. We'll, we'll kind of go anecdotally and figure it out. <laughs> But, you know, when like Forecasta and SFR Analytics came around, it was a revelation for us, right? Because then you could really kind of narrow down how many of our types of loans are being done in the space. So then you could be much more specific, like why you're going to a place, who's doing loans there, will our product compete? Because look, the other thing, Kevin, you'll laugh, we haven't changed our product much at all in 15 years. Yeah, let's get into that. So the product, I mean, I know you guys are doing what, we, what we're calling hard money. So is it fix and flip and construction or is it is yeah. anything else that you're doing? Nope. We do fix and flip. And then, you know, the borrower either sells it or they refinance out, hold it, create a rental. Right. And literally, that is what we've done the entire time. Right. But with that, though, like, you know, okay, so it, one of the things that happens for a lot of our clients, we, we noticed a trend in Texas where... When I first joined the firm, everyone was doing fix and flip in Texas. And then all of a sudden, local lenders in Texas started gravitating more to ground-up construction because everyone was a builder. So true ground-up construction. Folks that said, hey, I'll never do a construction loan. Three years later, we started doing it because of the demand. And then now today, you know, well, not right now, but for a while, people were trying to figure out DSCR in Texas. And it doesn't pencil in Texas right now. Well, in Northern Texas, it does. In Austin, it doesn't really pencil. But so the market has been changing a lot. You saw a lot yeah. of institutional attention starting in 16 into Texas. Everyone, I mean, the institutions love Texas. And yep. so, you know, that's a whole other kind of formula, comparatively speaking, and just sticking to your two products there. Were, yeah. Did you have ground construction early on or, or was it just? No. no, no. So we never did it. We shied away from it. Uh -huh. um, but we started doing it a few years ago, right? Just so the recently. demand was there. And so we started a few years ago, we will do new construction, little different criteria for us on the borrower, right. different uh, locations that, that we'll look at. We like to understand the, uh, we want to know the neighborhood better, right? Right. Uh, on new construction, we want the borrower to have some experience doing new construction. You know, one of the things unique about us, Kevin, is that we would do newbies, borrowers from day one. New builders. Yeah. 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 I mean, new investors. And look, a lot of our investors are not, they're not builders, right? They're not traditional real estate guys. They're yeah, much they're more real people guys. That, they're investors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They wanted to supplement their income and stuff. Yeah. Right. But, and there, that's a need that, well, it's kind of funny because a lot of lenders used to uh, tr track those guys and kind of teach them to become lenders. I, I mean, better investors and better builders. And that's now today becoming a target audience that are certain institutional players are actually going after via software and education platform. So it's not a new formula. It definitely has proven to work. Now, I have to ask, Longhorn has been around for a long time and also remarkably well known in circles. Whenever we talk about Texas, whenever we, whenever we have kind of sit downs with people and we do round tables at conferences, you guys come up a lot, but we don't see you guys out there. Uh, you guys don't do a lot of marketing, but uh, what's when are we going to see you guys at, at an AAPL or, or at one of our conferences one of these days? So we went to the first AAPL conference. Yeah. We were at the very first one and everything. The tiny little one, that conference room? Yeah, No, no. Well, second one. I, I guess it might have been the second one there, anything. So it was in Vegas, right? So so we went to that one. And then, you know, we had gone to Pitbull for a while. Um, but look, 
you know, for, for us, we really just wanted to focus on the core of what we did and, and really wanted to be very, you know, uh, thoughtful and mindful of who we're trying to target and everything. And, you know, we did things differently. Look, I'm not from a traditional mortgage background, right? So I, I'm not I'm, I'm not looking to do things exactly how everyone else is doing it. I, you know, we've kind of stuck to a certain way of way we do things. It's been successful. And so I just tried to keep growing it and keep, keep doing that. Now, my, my sales guys have been to the Apple the last two years. Right, 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 right. right, uh, right. So, so, so they like to go to that stuff. Um, and, and look, when, when we go to these conferences, you know, at this point now, like I, I'm happy to speak. And, and I think I would be speaking to most of the people there that, that are, are brokers or small fund managers and want to become bigger fund managers, right? And, and manage that. And there is no magic formula, right? There is no secret to it. It's just, it's a bunch of hard work, right? A bunch and, of hard work, a lot of grinding. Yep. yep. And, and, and the way we do it too makes it more challenging, right? Because, you know, we have to raise the capital, right? So there's a, a whole thing of that. We haven't gone the institutional route, right? We have not gone. We are 355 different individual investors in our fund and, you know, bank lines of credit. Right now, we're fairly large now, size, sophisticated bank line of credit. Right uh, here, I'll give you a, my shout out to my lines of credit. Right, Veritex Bank. I've been with them since 2012, and yeah, they I are, I've been in Texas. I like it because th those guys are doing very well for themselves, and they really came on strong, especially in Texas. So they're they're a good yeah. bank, yeah. And they've been great to us, right? So you know, it's it's a fun story that you know they they started out with a million dollar line of credit. And I like to tell the story that I you know think about me going to banks in 2010, 2011 oh, for gosh. lines of credit. Everybody said no, right? No. I, I mean, yeah, we just got there shot were down. Some institutional programs out there, but they were very expensive and mark to market. It was it's sketchy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's too complicated, right? It's too yeah. you know we're simpletons, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we didn't want to make it super confusing. So Veritex has been great. They've grown with us. We're still with them, right? You know, 12 years later. And then recently, just this year, we closed the line of credit with Atlas, Atlas SP. And so, um, look, I never thought we'd be where we were, right? Our original PPM said uh, we could raise $40 million of capital. And, you know, we're right now, we've raised $155 million of capital through 355 investors, right, in our fund. And we've got four hundred million dollars of available leverage between Atlas and Veritex. So roughly about half a billion dollars uh, AUM yeah. total. Now let me ask you this: like, so in the life cycle of the fund, you know, one of the key questions I want to ask from that is like, was there a moment when it it started to really click and started to hum? Yeah, I mean, uh, so listen, the, the key was it, it took some discipline in the very beginning. Our individual note holders did not want to go to the fund. Yeah. Right. They very rarely want to transition over. It's very hard. Yeah. They don't. And so it was hard for me, but I had to tell them I wasn't going to send them any more deals. And we were basically yes. playing. <laughs> listen, we were playing poker a little bit, right? No, but because it's, it I, works. Right. But I didn't have the money necessarily to no, fund I, all the I, deals, I, right? It's scary. It's, it's so scary because that's proven to work. You know it's a thing that's gonna it's all re reliable. But yep. yeah. No, so you had to be, you. yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Uh, you, you had to be disciplined and just say, look, we're not, we're not going to send you any more deals. Yeah. And so look, I had a bunch of investors that did not come over and then they call three months later and go, Hey, you haven't sent me any deals. Yeah. And I'd be like, I told you, I wasn't going to send you more deals. I yeah, go, if you want to be in the fund, you can be in the fund. And, and I always tell my clients on the fund side, like, hey, this is a kind of an all or nothing kind of arrangement. If you're doing trustees, you, you can't. You can't scale a business and trustee and you can't and you, your fund becomes a second option to your investors because yep. they're always going to go the old reliable. They're the ones that like that stuff. Good luck getting them to you know. You can't twist their arm into it unless you actually force their hand. And that's it. You do. And you know what's funny is that actually this formula recently is a um, client of mine here in San Diego in, in California. He's in San Diego. He did the same thing. He did the exact same thing. Hey, clients, it's fun or bust. I'm not. Do not trust us anymore? Come on over. And they finally did. So, I mean, listen, that, that's one of the hardest lessons to learn for people is like, you have to gamble on yourself a little bit. You have to believe in yourself, but it works. I've never yeah. seen it not work. I've always seen it work because investors, at the end of the day, boil down to your relationship with you, right? I mean, it, it's not a deal as much, right? I mean, no. they come back to the table because you guys, you guys find good deals. 
Right. I so. mean, if you if you delivered for them for the last three or four years, right, they don't want to let it go. Exactly. I mean, look, look, let's also be be honest here, right? There's a little greed tied to it, right? They they have this investment, it's been churning, it's working really well, and you tell them, hey, we're going to change it a little bit, but here's the return you're going to get. It's going to be consistent. Right. You're going to be safer. You're not tied into one deal, and you know it's a leap of faith, right? Everyone's got to take a little bit and everything. And look, my favorite was I had one investor call me like six months later and he's like, all right. He goes, you win. He goes, can I put money in the fund? Cause he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't come over. He's now been with us over 10 years and uh, he's been a great investor, but you know, we, we, we giggle about it. Like him and I talk and he'll be like, yeah, I didn't want to come over and all that. And he goes, but I wanted those returns still. And I right. was like, yeah, yeah, we can provide the returns. You just got to trust us. Right. Um, Let me ask you this though. So you got you guys have been raising money in your fund now for ten plus years. Is there anything not necessarily you know the asset class? We know what the asset class is. We know what the return model looks like, generally speaking. But is there anything else on you as a sponsor, you as a as a fund manager, as capital raiser, could tell our audience? Because most of my clients are listening. A lot of them are emerging managers. A lot of them are existing managers. Anything that you know? Hey, this really really helped us when we're out there raising money, was it, you know, doing events? Was it doing luncheons or was it getting out there and just, you know, just dialing for dollars every week? Or was it an auto dialer? Like, is there anything that you guys did that really helped move the needle? Yeah, there's a couple of things I think you need to do, right? And it, it's fundamentals, right? So number one, uh, do what you say you're going to do. Uh, if you're going to report to your investors every quarter by the 15th of the month, Report to your investors every quarter by the 15th of the month, right? Right. Um, that's number one. Number two, tell them when something goes wrong, right? Uh, I think being honest and candid with them uh, builds you a lot of credibility. And number three, get audited financials. Get your financials audited as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah. And it's a pain. I mean, in the beginning, it's a pain in the butt because you're small it's expensive, yep. it's time consuming. But if you will do that, uh, it's hugely, it builds your credibility with your investors, right? Um, and those are the things you gotta do. And look, we're 506 Reg B, right? Not Reg C. So we're right. not out there Can't marketing, market soliciting, nope. anything like that. It's word of mouth. And look, the other thing at the end of the day I've learned, if you deliver the performance you say you're gonna deliver, your investors are your marketing arm, right? Because they are out there. No, everybody loves to tell their buddies how smart they were to invest with this guy and they're making this return and he's been doing it forever. It is the best referral source you can have. Now, all these years later, have you guys started to tap into some of the bigger ticket investors, the the advisor communities and all that? Because at your side, that's where a lot of folks are thinking about like, okay, we need some bigger ticket investors or has it been more of like, okay, let's keep growing this organically. So we have not gone registered investor route. We have all, it's all been organic. We have not done uh, any big ticket items. Look, here's the other thing too. I've talked to plenty of institutional folks that have said, hey, we'd like to put money in your fund. Uh, great. But we want our own deal. Yeah, sidecar. We'd like a sidecar deal. Yeah, they always yeah. do. They always do, yeah. They always do. And I've said no to everyone because I'm just like, I think I would alienate my current investor group if I gave someone else a special deal. Now you can justify it by saying, well, hey, you know, you put in $250,000, they put in 10 million bucks. Um, it warrants a special deal, but I just haven't wanted to do that. Um, I'd rather work a little harder, see if I can raise the capital. Um, you know, I've worked harder on, on debt. You know, the last three years, I've worked really hard on debt, getting it to a, a certain level, um, which by the way, that that is its own challenges for guys like us. Uh, in our it's space, not a lot of options. There's only, at best, maybe ten players. You know, it's tough. Yeah, and and even then, they're going to institutionalize you, right? One of the beauties, one of the beauties yep. of our space is, if you wanted to do a deal, you could do a deal, right? If you had the capital, you were running a fund, you want to do a deal, you could do a deal. If you want to go get some of the bigger boys' money uh, as debt, uh, those days are over. Uh, you better be disciplined. You better be conformed. You better be doing things. If you have underwriting guidelines, you need to make sure you follow your own underwriting guidelines. Right. Well, did you have trouble adjusting? Because you know, the first thing 
that banks instituted in our space for leverage was always, listen, you don't have to run FICO up front, but we're going to need some kind of you know soft credit pool. We're going to need some kind of desktop to backfill um, those kind of issues. And in traditional hard money, FICO and appraisal has never been something we want to do, right? So I except the when we the way we got started, yeah. we pulled credit from day one. We've oh, always pulled credit, always, and we always got an appraisal. So from day one, I think you're the first Texas lender I've ever met that started with appraisals and FICO. That's unheard of in Texas hard money. So I mean, I mean, let me know more. Well, no. I mean, look, a couple things, right? Uh, number one, you know, we didn't know anything about hard money, right? So we were lawyers and we were trying to mitigate risks, number one. But number two, when you're raising money and asking someone to do it, and they're like, what underwriting have you done on the borrower? And look, from the very beginning, we uh, pulled credit and we had last three months of bank statements, right? That was from the very beginning. And then number two, we got appraisals on the property, right? Because by the way, 2008, richer values didn't exist. You know, desktop underwriting, that's only for the big boys, right? We didn't want to make up the value, right? So we got independent third-party appraisers. And that was a great selling point to our investors also is that, hey, someone real is determining the value of the property, even though it is the after repair value and obviously run the risk of the repairs being done or not done or done done well. And um, and so we've done it from day one. So it, it was never an adjustment for us to go get, uh, you know, when we went to get our first line of credit with Veritex, we explained them what we did. They were good with that. Uh, ultimately, when we got to Atlas, you know, some of them were kind of laughing because they're like, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, under $400,000 value, right. you know, if you want right. to use desktop or richer value or something like that. But it also helped us in dealing with the borrowers in that there was no arguments about the value of the property. Like we tell them up front, hey, third party, independent third party sets the value. We lend based on that, right? Especially at early stage. Did you feel like it would it would kind of put you at a disadvantage from a competitive standpoint? Because your competitors in Texas weren't doing it. We know for a fact they weren't doing it. So like, how do you compete with that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenging issue when you're dealing with a, especially an inexperienced borrower. Look, we thought that it would help uh, the borrower, right? We're like, look, we're on your team here. Like, we don't want to do a loan just to do a loan, right? We want to do a loan that you're going to be successful at and come back and do another deal with us, right? And so we're going to get independent third-party appraisal. You can look at it. You can decide what you think. Because look, the wholesaler, not to disparage wholesalers, right? Because they're a huge part of our industry, but they've got an incentive to sell the property. And so the higher the value of the property is, the better they're, the more spread it is on the deal that they're selling to the borrower, the better it is for them. But for us, it's like, look, we're putting more money out there on the deal than the borrower is. We want the borrower to be successful and get a good deal. I do not want to take back properties, right? You take back a property, it's a loser, right? We don't get the good ones back. You only get the bad ones back. But look, if there's a lender out there that's making money on taking back on REOs, let me know because uh, I haven't been able to figure out how to do it for uh, 15 years now. And I've been telling clients for years, you can't expect to make money on REO. You you you, you, you can't. It's not. If you're, it means you're under. It means you you've taken back a loser. You expect to expect to make your money back at best, you know. So. Even in certain markets, oh, yeah. you can't. No, you're going to lose that way. You you don't set any weird expectations with investors. You know, I, I'd like Correct. to ask you about kind Correct. of the you know later stage, the past few years now, because we've seen a massive disruption to the state of Texas and other markets that you're in as well. Tennessee became just inundated, and now North Carolina is becoming inundated with new lenders and. And flooding in markets, you know, lenders are flooding into that market. But at the same time, we've also seen a significant increase in quote unquote institutionalization. Now, your model doesn't strike me as too, you know, quote unquote old school, you know, private money. I mean, I still view it, you, you because of the FICO and the appraisals, you know, you've been a private lender, if we'll use the Harlan's, you know, early on. Did you guys ever start like selling paper or working with the institutions in that regard? Or was it just leverage? Because the market was probably chasing you to sell them some loans, right? You know, in, in around 16. We did. We've talked to a lot of folks over the years about selling notes, but I've never wanted to sell notes, right? Because look, if I would sold notes, I, I should have done it years ago when they get paid right, you more spread, right? right? Uh, you know, what's happened over the last, look, we saw... We saw, here's what happened to us, right? 20, 
2017, 2018, 2019, right? We saw price compression, right? Like I told you guys, 14 and four, that didn't exist anymore, right? We were down to 12 and three. And even then we were at the high end of the market. And so it, it was it was more challenging to get deals, right? Our little competitive edge at that point is we're 100% LTC, right? We're a pure ARV lender. We will do 100% LTC. We don't, we don't question it. Um, just depends what the ARV is. So that was always our competitive edge. 2022, right? Uh, end of 2022, everyone can see interest rates are about to go up. And so that's when things got interesting for us, right? Because we felt we were built to handle that, that it wasn't going to really affect us that much. But what we thought happened was all of a sudden interest rates, look, my line of credit, uh, December 31st, uh, 2022 was at 3.75% fixed, right? Uh, January 1, uh, 2023, it went to, you know, SOFR plus 3.10, uh, vari right, variable rate. So it doubles overnight, uh, uh, essentially over the next six months. And so a lot of the note buyers, the spread was gone, right? I had taken I don't know. I'd I'd sold $5 million worth of notes like in 2018, 2019, just to see if I could, right? I was just curious if we could do it. And I will say the 100% LTC makes it more challenging, right? Uh, the note buyers were looking for 90, 95%, 85% LTC. 100% LTC made it much more challenging. So we had sold $5 million worth of notes. But once the interest rates went up and there wasn't, from my perspective, a lot of our competitors went away, right? Some note buyers disappeared. People got out of the space because now it wasn't the easy money. It wasn't the spreads you were making. It became much more challenging. And our loan volume went up dramatically. And I've had to sell over the last two years. I actually sold before we got the Atlas line done about $50 million worth of notes um, just because the loan right. volume had increased so much, right? And we couldn't, the right. capital raise couldn't keep up. The debt couldn't keep up. Um, so look, we're... we're now we're at the place now where our debt has kept up. And so now I'm looking to raise more capital and thinking about different ways and different strategic ways uh, that, you know, we can talk about on, on part two of our podcast we'll do next time uh, about different strategic ways about raising capital without going the institutional route, right? Uh, without going to uh, some big investor that puts it in or wants a sidecar deal or says, create a second fund and I'll help you do this. Um, you know, there's some ways we've been thinking about, you know, how to attack that. And hopefully I'll have some good stories for you. Uh, in a couple months that we could talk about that. Well, actually, I want to ask you about the, the loan sales. So, so purely the, the only reasoning was this is not a creative. The, 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 the spreads weren't there. You never had any, I guess, philosophical uh, resistance to it. Just it's not make, you can't make much money off of it. Or is it more, is, are there, are there business reasons behind beyond the economics? Well, yeah, I mean, look, look, I think originating the note, look, I think large institutional players, they want to put tens of million dollars in play at, at a time, right? Fundamentally, we're different, right? Uh, when I first started, the average side loan was $125,000 that we did, right? 15 years later, my average loan is $230,000, right? I still do small, but grinding it out one at a time, doing those loans, to me, that's the hard work of it. And then to sell the note off and just make, and, and now, you know, just make a tiny little bit of spread that that I feel like I'm giving it away. You work so hard I, I to get the loan the door right? and Figure take care out. of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We had another guest on the yes, show have the same yes, philosophy. Yes, yeah. I get it. I get it. It makes sense. And the interesting part, though, is, you know, you mentioned spreads and stuff is, you know, when the, it's currently, it's September 16th, uh, and we're all waiting. We're all wondering what's going to happen. And we got to, you know, I got bets with friends about what the number is going to be, you know, what the cut's going to be. And, and And we're headed toward a kind of adjustment in that regard. Let me ask you this. If, if the market were to change, we do know for a fact capital markets is just getting, just dumping capital into the space. It's very attractive. All the rated deals and unrated deals on the securization side that's happening. Like there's going to be folks knocking on, breaking down your door because to get volume. I mean, yep. if the market, yep. would there be a point in time where you, you would reconsider that? Or is it more, hey, philosophically, even back when the spreads were good, it wasn't the best for us? Is it more like, more like that? Philosophically, I'd rather not. 
you know, I'd rather not. And look, part of it's probably the lawyer, me, a little bit of a control freak on it. Like, I don't want to sell my notes. I want to be in charge of it. Um, you know, if I've got to work deals out with the borrower, it becomes much easier if if we hold the note rather than we sell you it. Service too. You service your own loans. We, right? we service our own things. We don't want to use third parties. Look, third parties, honestly, for us, it delays everything, right? There's a third yeah. party servicer. It just it just takes longer to get stuff done. It jeopardizes your borrower relationship too significantly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to now securitization and that um you know, we're just trying to understand it exactly. Like, cause you know, the rates sound great, but they don't tell you how much it costs to actually get a securitization done. When you factor that in, what is the rate you're really getting? You're looking at about a million dollars, probably a little bit more than that in your first one. But you're paying a bunch of people, right? You're paying much more expensive attorneys than I, and then you're also paying bankers and diligence and it's going to be a lot. And it's not going to be cheap. Right? But, but and, and it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot that, of work. That you've got to do. But, your entire, your entire tape has to be diligence, right? So, right. You have to run diligence. You have to now have the banker trying to take your take your deal to market. The offering documents have to be put together. But interestingly enough, like if the volume is there, you know, annually, a lot of times people will, oh, well, as this thing grows, I think that price point is going to come down. I think a lot of it's going to become commoditized in its own right for multi-lender securitization. We don't know where it's going to end up, but next year will be a much more attractive year than this year. I tell you every you know if you if you are a high volume lender if you can do about three to five hundred million dollars a year, it's worth looking at just because the the amount of leverage that you can get through this makes a bear, a warehouse line look like a joke you know it just it's it's comparatively speaking so the it's, accretiveness it, to your investors is just it massive. It does it does, but you've also raised a bunch of capital. If you've raised a bunch of capital and you do it a securitization, then is your capital making a return? Right. Well, yeah, and th and that's the challenging issue, right? With lenders that have debt funds, well, how do I make sure that I take care of my my investors and fulfill my fiduciary obligations? But there's ways to skin that cat. I've I've had conversations with a lot of clients who are like you know larger fund managers, half a billion, a billion, and they want to do a securitization. They want to explore. Well, let's talk about it. You're in the unique camp, I would say, of very few balance sheet lenders that actually do run FICO and appraisal. Yep. So you're ahead of the curve. Because a lot of folks just don't do that, and they're going to have to adjust to it. You're already doing that, so I think you're in a good position to think about it. I, I'm happy to talk about it offline, but <laughs> it's a really, really interesting strategy. And most people in your position are just like, that sounds like so much work because we have to change our underwriting. I, I don't think you might, yeah, you might not even have to. So, and that's an interesting way to look at it. And balancing that with your investors, there's ways to make your investors align with you and participate in the upside. No, that's the key. And and look, you take a portion of your book, right? You, you, you take a portion of your book, I think, is the way to do it. You know, it, like right now, we're, we're at about 350, 360 million in loans on our books. If you took 200 million, right, and did a securitization, I think that's probably you know, 175, 200 million. That's right. That's kind of the right number. Yeah, I think smaller deals will start penciling in probably next year, the year after. So it, it might be worth looking at. And I think any larger fund manager should, because if you if you understand if you utilize leverage anyway, I think it's worth considering from a financial oh, yeah. standpoint. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And let me, let me ask you this: When it comes to the fund itself, over the years, there must have been kind of you know iterations for you, like. Like uh, the core question is why are we sticking with just the say the same fund for ten? Not actually, no, fourteen years now. So 14 twelve years, or 12, 12, or twelve years. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are we sticking with the same fund? Because a lot of sponsors in your position may start fund number two. Markets just all over the place. Rates are dipping. Like, what's kept you sticking with the same open ended fund? So I guess I've asked the question is why do they do multiple funds, right? Like, like that to me is is the better question because look. For us, it's one fund, right? We, we've set our PPM up. We've set our, our what our goals are, what our investor goals are, what we're trying to do. And if we start a second fund, aren't we competing with our first fund? And so that's the way I kind of look at it. It's like, look, if we've got this one fund and, and, and we're successful at it, why do we start a second and third? And then you've got to worry about, don't we? aren't we going to be doing the same thing I did way back when and trying to transition people from fund one over to fund two? And you potentially could lose investors there. And so I haven't heard a good explanation yet from someone on why, why have multiple funds? Like I don't, to me, that's just a lot more work. 
Another set of audited financial. You guys, you guys are mitigating your rate compression issues in, in Texas because of the other markets you're in, right? I mean, those are still doing solid numbers, twelve plus returns, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and look, all of this also, you, you want to have realistic expectations for your investors, right? I mean, we all along look. Our our goal is ten percent, right? Our our goal is to get our investors ten percent. Um, and you know, when you hit that mark or get a little above it or maybe a little below it. Typically, they're okay with it, right? And so as long as, you know, I feel like the market will talk to you, right? If, if, if all of your investors start, or large chunks start exiting your fund, then you probably need fund number two and you got to retool and figure out what you want to do. That's a good way to look at it. And that's probably usually the reason we, I mean, if you think Great Compression in Texas was bad, California was seeing eight and a half percent mix and flip deals. That was a lot of times when lenders were trying to look at retooling to fund number two because of rate compression and their fund was built for a vintage that they can't sustain anymore. So, okay, cool. Uh, uh, now, from a business standpoint, I'd like to ask, uh, give me more about, uh, about the company because when you started, it was you and your partner, both attorneys. Yep. It's very rare to see attorneys jump into this space. I can only name a few others. Um, and now you have this huge business and you know lending in multiple states. There, give me an idea of what the team looked like back then and when you guys started adding people and how you guys did it. Yeah, so it's, yes, started out two of us, right? And you just added one at a time, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, got a loan processor and then we had a, a, a someone that went out, you know, marketed for our loans. Um, and look, we, you know, one of us was the back end, one was the front end, right? We rotated, right? It was just, it was a lot of grind. Oh, you sw- back and forth? That you well, guys swim? For? Yeah, I mean, it, and then so we figured out what we were good at. Right. So, right. Hey, hey, you can do this. I can do this. I mean, we both would go to events and speak, come back to the office, have to, you know, pull out the spreadsheets right before software, tracking the loans, tracking the money for the investors. And then slowly over time, um, you know, we added, started adding people. And now today, you know, we've got about 55 people on the team, right? Like uh, 22 salespeople. Um, and then, you know, about 30, we've got processors, we have underwriters, finance team, uh, REO managers, draw managers. Um, you know, it's a, it's a full blown operation now, like, like right. beyond where I ever thought we would get to. Right. But right. you got to do it. I mean, and how, how's the weight back office versus front office? What would you say where the weight is? So, you know, the front, the front facing is the sales guy. So there's, you know, 22 of those folks, right. That they're out there still, we still preach the gospel of hard money. And then, you know, about 30 on the back end. Cause look, you got to run audits, right? Auditing reports, uh, managing the financials. Now, look, when you have multiple for us, when you have multiple debt instruments, then we have multiple entities. So it's consolidated financials, far more complicated, right? The more loans you do. And one of my favorite things, Kevin, is when people tell me they're in the business, they've never had a loan go bad. And I'm like, then you're not doing enough loans. Because yeah. that's not possible, Long, right? numbers. Loans are going to go bad. Yeah. It's going to so, happen. That, that's, that, to me, I don't understand that logic. It's not possible. No. And, and so, you know, if you do 2 to 3% foreclosure rate and, you know, you're doing uh, 500 loans a year and then you go to 1,000 loans a year or 1,500 loans a year, the amount of REOs you're going to have is more, right? So it's going to happen. Yep. Now you got to deal with more of that. Look, it, it's, it's always, a, it, you're, you're trying to balance it out, right? You're trying to, you know, Money, loans, people, work to right. do. It's it's a constant, it's a constant balancing act, right? With an emerging manager though, right? So we have a lot of clients that are, you know, they have a lending business, they do a certain, you know, sort of good amount of volume, and they're starting up their new fund and it's a small team, right? The principals, maybe a staff member or the kind of yep. assistant. What would you tell them? Hey, your first hire should be this. Get somebody in the title business. Closings. Get somebody that understands title, closings. They understand the speed of what we're trying to work. They're going to be able to recognize a whole bunch of different problems that you, as a, maybe you're the front end guy, the mortgage guy, you don't understand on the back end. Uh, they can help you with servicing. They can help you with processing. Like a lot of our people are former escrow officers. We have a, a bunch of lawyers uh, on our team and not in legal positions, but just lawyers. And then we have a bunch of people that were escrow officers. Because look, we've also learned that, look, when I first started, I wanted to close loans in three to five days, right? I'm like, why why can't we do that, right? 
And but traditional folks from the traditional mortgage world, they're not used to that. And Much. so yeah. hard time adjusting. Escrow officers, they're used to everything happening at the last minute, closing fast, people yelling at them, scrambling to get stuff done. I, I found that they've been much more equipped to handle the pace uh, right. of what we do. And they're also equipped with some detail orientation. They understand yeah. closing, they understand loan processing, they understand what a checklist looks, how that works. And that's actually a really great point. It's a good resource because like one of the things that the number one recruiting request that I get is like, hey, Kevin, I need someone to help me run underwriting or run processing. Like, I don't have anyone for that. Like, all we can offer is Melissa's team as a loan doc, as a loan doc service provider, right? They, they're a world law firm that closes loans, but it's like, well, that's different, right? You need someone to an employee. Okay. That's a good point. I like that. Yeah. 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 Um, ne next question I'd like to ask you is, is, you know, looking forward into the future because, you know, you guys have been around since 2011 and, you know, there's very few outfits that have been around since, since that long. And I would like to ask actually no, 08 really. So you guys are very, very few in number, and in Texas, there's probably a handful of guys that have yeah. made it through. And I like to ask you kind of now looking forward, right? Because we're looking into an interesting environment, right? We still have a lot of deals to do in Resi. There's so much opportunity, but Texas has become quite challenging. In the markets that you're in, also like, you know, in the Midwest is starting to become attractive to a lot of lenders. What are the things that you guys are working on and excited for come 25 and in the future? Well, we're trying to grow. I mean, we're for yeah. sure trying to grow. Obviously, experienced, established salespeople, I think, are hugely important. Um, and then, look, new products, right? Uh, new construction, right? We started that a couple of years ago. We want to grow that. And then, look, one of the interesting things of working with uh, an Atlas is, you know, maybe come up with some products that are unique, that are different, that can help us... Uh, you know, uh, stand out from from other lenders, right? Not just the same old, same old. Um, there's a couple things we've been working on for a while that we would like to get rolled out there, right? To become more attractive to people. Um, and because we want to grow. foray into commercial real estate a little bit, maybe? About multifamily? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Not, not, right. not commercial. Better products uh, on the single family side, right? Okay. I want to, I, I still want to focus on that because look, that's what we do. That That's the core of what we do. I don't want to go away from that, but I, I do think there's some products out there that people have tried for a long time that haven't been successful at that. If we could get the right financing partner involved, uh, we think could be successful. Um, so look at that. And then look, like I said, we're, I got to raise more capital to do that. Right. So I, I'm working on ways to bring more capital into the fund um, because that allows you uh, to do more things. Um, so that that's really the focus for us. I'm going to really focus on the 10 states that we're in. I, I want to do a little bit better, right? In every state that we're in, uh, capture a little bit of more of the market, you know, just incrementally, right? Um, we go look at the forecasted data, this, uh, the SFR analytics data, where we are. Okay, can we pick up a little bit more in these places? What do we need to do? Uh, what could distinguish ourselves? But yeah, it's about to be super interesting again because rates go down again. Um, it's going to get very competitive. Yeah, I think so. I think also capital markets is going to make balance lenders' lives quite difficult over the next few months. <laughs> but I, I also think that they're going to push harder on the DSCR product. It, it seems to be much more accretive to everybody right now. So, you know, it's not, yeah. we're not, I mean, cuts not going to be that meaningful. I mean, it's what, 50 basis points, 20, even 100. It's not compared to where we were in 21. Oh, no, no, no. So, yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see on that. I mean, you guys don't touch DSCR, do you? No, you know, we got in at the worst possible time. We started to try to do it in like, uh, what, March of 23? Oh, yeah. Uh, that was awful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awful timing. <laughs> terrible experience. Terrible experience with yeah, the borrower. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 was, it, was, it did not work out well so, uh, so well for us. Right, right. Well, I mean, listen, it's a looking at, worth looking at now. And rates have come yeah. down below conventional mortgage. It's fascinating where it's at. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, well, you know, I think that, that that's about all the time we have for this episode. Mike, thanks. I mean, this is full by. Thanks for doing the episode. Sure. I the interview. I really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you guys who want to learn more about Long Order, you guys can check them out online. Uh, you can also reach out to Mike. We'll put his information out on the pod. Uh, Mike, I hope we can do the uh, round two once uh, some of those, those mission critical yeah. ideas have manifested. Let us know. We're happy to bring you on the show and talk about it. Uh, we love talking about kind of 
big events in companies life cycle. So uh, please, please let us know. And for all of our listeners out there, thank you for joining us for another episode of Lander Lounge. This is Kevin Kim signing off. You've been listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim, brought to you by Jirasi LLP, the nation's largest private lending law firm. Jirasi is the leading legal resource for specialty lenders, asset-based lenders, private lenders, and non-bank institutions. Learn more about the firm at jirasilawfirm.com. That's G-E-R-A-C-I lawfirm.com. Check out our episode summary to subscribe to our Lender Lounge newsletter and our law firm newsletter, where you can get notified about new episodes and recent content directly from our expert attorneys. In addition, we'd love if you follow Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim on YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, and on LinkedIn, where you can also check out updates from Jirasi LLP. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. This is Kevin Kim, signing off.